Okay, good morning. I'm Enrico Vesperini. I'm a faculty in the astronomy department. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you a bit about the work we do in my group. And uh, this talk is split in two parts. I will give you an overview of different projects and Vasla, who is consulting the group and lecturing the physics assistant. The department will give you an overview of the computational aspects and complexities of the simulations we do. So what we do is formation and dynamic evolution global star clusters. What are global star clusters? You have a nice picture here, along with big red 200, which for us is absolutely essential to do the work we do. And so global star cluster is a stellar system. These stellar systems are among the oldest stellar systems in the universe with an age between 11 and 13 billion years. Total solar mass in this system is between 10 to the four and 10 to the six solar masses. They are very compact, very small objects, three to four parsecs, if you are familiar with units that astronomers use, otherwise, 13 to 15 light years or 10 to the 14 kilometers. Very high densities. In a cubic parts, like there are between 10 and 10 to the five solar masses. And just as a comparison, when you look at the sky at night, the number of stars, the density around the sun is of the order of 0 0.1 solar masses per cubic parts. And again, to give you an idea of what that means, this is a virtual reality visualization developed in collaboration with the Advanced Visualization Lab here at IU. And this is the night sky with the number of stars, actual number of stars. If you go to a dark place, that's the number of stars that you will see. It must be really dark place, otherwise you will not see it. But if the Earth was at the edge of a star cluster, that's what we would see. And if the Earth was at the center of a star cluster, that's what we would see. Beautiful sky, probably not as good for astronomers because we wouldn't be able to see much. But nevertheless, so that's to give you an idea of the meaning of the high densities that global clusters are characterized by. So where are these star clusters? They are everywhere. In our Milky Way, we have about 150 of these objects which survived. We think many more existed uh, yeah, early in the history of the Milky Way. Other, <coughs> sorry, other galaxies like the M87, this big elliptical galaxy, contains of the order of several thousands of global clusters. And there are beautiful objects like the merging galaxy there where not only you, we can find old global clusters, but also young clusters forming right now as a result of the, the merging process. So what we do, we do this. We follow the dynamical evolution of these systems, how their structures and internal kinematics is changing over billions of years. We see what happens to the stars inside the clusters and so on, how these clusters dissolve and how the stars, which are originally in global clusters, end up populating the Milky Way, their host galaxy. And we think these objects might be big contributors to the stellar population of the galaxy. And the problem in principle is easy. You provide the equations for the motion of the stars to big red 200, and you get that animation. Well, not so easy, because in reality, the dynamics of these objects is very complex. And here, this diagram taken from this textbook by Douglas Hagen and Pete Foot, illustrates this complexity and shows the close connection and interplay between different components, different ingredients of global clusters. There is the internal dynamics, how their structure evolve, how the stars segregate and depending on their mass populate different regions, how stars escape, what is the effect of close encounters between stars and so on. And all those components there affect the stellar uh, constituents of clusters, so how many stars there are in a cluster, what is the distribution of the stellar masses, the production of so-called exotic objects like X-ray sources or binary black holes, which have been found <coughs> to emit gravitational waves recently. And in turn, also the galaxy where global clusters live are 
affecting the evolution by truncating these systems with their uh, tidal fish. So even if in a simplified version of simulations that where you, let's say that you decide to ignore some of those aspects, which very often we do because we focus on specific questions which do not necessarily require to include all the ingredients, but even in the most uh, simplified simulations, what we are dealing with is the variety of uh, time scales which make our simulation extremely computationally expensive. So the many basic ingredients here are characterized by these time scales. We have the time scale of physical collisions. They do not happen very often, but they are interesting and they happen on time scale of a few hours. Binary stars, as I will mention quickly in a little bit, are very important for the dynamics of clusters and they might have periods shorter than one year. Dynamical time, which is the time a star takes to cross the entire classes of the order of a million years. And what we are interested in is to follow the evolution of these systems for a time scale of the order of billions of years. And this evolution is to properly model the evolution on this time scale. We need to make sure that we are properly modeling all these uh, processes which have much shorter time scales. So global clusters are a standard sentence, are ideal laboratories, but they indeed are to study many fundamental questions in astrophysics, going from the star structure formation in the very early universe, stellar evolution, stellar dynamics, the interplay between stellar dynamics and stellar evolution, the formation of exotic objects like X-ray binaries, gravitational wave sources, and in China, they are also used as probes to study the evolution and the formation of galaxies. So what I'm going to do, it's a quick overview of the work done by yeah, our group, by graduate students, postdocs, and a number, large number of international collaborators. This is a very recent project, which took a few million hours of Big Red 200, is CPU hours, of course. And this is a cosmological simulation attempting to model the evolution, formation, and evolution of clusters in the first billion year of life of the universe. This is a map of the dark matter. This is a map of the stellar density. And all those clumps that you see there are probably the progenitors, what we think might be the progenitors of young global clusters. Okay? And so this is very timely as very recent observation from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, provided indication of the presence of some of these clumps uh, in the early universe and JWST, the newest NASA Space Telescope is going to provide a lot of data on this kind of objects in the early universe. So we are building this theoretical framework to provide an interpretation of data that are coming from JWST and guide future observational proposals. This is work done by Alex Livernois, a graduate student working with me, who is doing great work. And this work is, on the other hand, focused on the evolution of individual global classes, not in cosmological context, before global clusters acquired a nice, almost spherical shape, they undergo some early evolutionary phases where they actually clumpy, they are not in equilibrium. And so what we have studied here, and this is where having multiple GPUs and a large cluster allows us to explore a variety of different initial conditions. So, and what Alex explored here is the early evolution of these clusters uh, assuming the presence of internal rotation with different degrees of clumpiness in their initial structure and providing a number of predictions for what to, we might expect to see either in the very young class in the universe or even in young clusters in the uh, local neighborhood of the sun. And this is an example of of a, a observation projects, which is connected with this uh, simulation carried out by Alex. 
A general other area that we are exploring is the evolution of the internal kinematics. Now, the traditional picture is that these systems are not internally rotating, they are isotropic, the velocity dispersion is the same in all directions. And you might think that we know a lot about the internal kinematics, but in reality, it's only in the last few years that observation studies have started to provide some information about the way stars move in these systems. And this animation, well, it's not an animation, yes. It's, the, it's an extrapolation of the motion of stars in a real globular cluster. This is the motion for the next 10,000 years. But this is not what HST measured. Again, this is an extrapolation of the motions measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the reason why this is happening only now, thanks to Hubble Space Telescope, is that the precision required to measure those motions is ex very extreme. So the precision required to make those uh, measurements is, give you an idea, it's the one that you need to measure the diameter of a human hair at a distance of a thousand kilometers. That's the kind of precision you need to have some reasonable information about the internal motions of these stars. And that animation there showed the extrapolation of this motion measured you know, over the time scale of a few years with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the other telescope there is the Gaia uh, telescope. So now that we know more about the internal kinematics, we are exploring the, and we have, what we have found uh, is that the clusters are characterized, actually characterized by internal rotation, that the, the velocity distribution is, a, is anisotropic, means that the velocity dispersion in different direction is not the same. So this is just a sketch. So we have done a lot of works to explore the implications of these kinematical properties. This is another paper recently published by Alex Levenois and various collaborators studying the dynamic evolution of the internal structure of rotating clusters. So those, this figure shows the structure of these rotating clusters, how different uh, stellar masses distribute, are distributed in the, in the cluster and various dynamical problems. With vast level, we have uh, We've done a series of papers exploring the evolution of the internal kinematics, the dependence of the evolution of the internal kinematics and binary stable evolution on the initial velocity distribution. Now that we know that clusters are not isotropically distributed, the, the, the velocity distribution is not isotropic, we have explored the dependence of the evolution on various degrees of radial anisotropy. And not only internal structure, various thermodynamical properties of these clusters and the role of what happens to binary stars. Now, why do we care about binary stars? Well, they play a very important role in the dynamics of clusters. And in turn, the environment of star clusters is affecting their evolution and is leading to the production of very interesting objects. So, for example, here, as you can imagine, the dense environment is one in which binary stars undergo frequent encounters with other single stars. They, for some time, they form these three star systems, and then the single star might they fly away and leave the binary star in a different uh, dynamical configuration from the one which uh, that characterizes the binary star when the interaction starts. So, one of the importance of binary stars in the dynamics of clusters is that they provide an energy source that stops the collapse of the cluster. The cluster over billion years becomes denser and denser and denser as it evolves for thermodynamical consideration that we will not discuss now, but the energy source responsible for halting this collapse and so it has a major role in the dynamics of clusters are binary stars. So binary stars play the same role that nuclear reactions play at the center of the sun. So, and on the other hand, the dynamics of cluster, the environment where these binary stars evolve is playing a major role in affecting their properties. So it's, we think that global clusters are the main factories of binary black holes, which have it can merge and produce the gravitational waves that have been recently measured by 
the LIGO collaboration we have shown here. This was one of the major uh, discoveries in physics in the last few years, one that led to a Nobel Prize the year after it was announced. And other exotic sources are these compact binaries made maybe by a new star or a binary and then a normal star, which is depositing a lot of gas on the compact object and emitting X-ray in the process. Finally, one, another general area where we do a lot of simulations is the one concerning the stellar population inside global clusters. And again, the traditional picture until a few years ago was that global clusters were simple stellar population, simple in the sense all of the same age and same chemical composition. And this picture was completely subverted by a number of observations based on the direct measurement of chemical abundances or the measurement of uh, chemical abundances through photometry, which show that stars in global clusters are actually characterized by a range of chemical properties and they are distinct groups of populations. So we don't, and this is another figure too in the presence of these discrete groups in these diagrams, which show color and luminosity of stars. So this was a major paradigm shift in the context of the study of global clusters, one that raised many new fundamental questions because now we don't have just one cluster. Within one cluster, we have a system composed of many, many, in some cases just two, but in other cases several, stellar generation of stars. And so, if we had fun with one class, and now we have even more fun because we have clusters inside classes. Okay, so these are simulations, and by that I mean different generation of clusters living in the same stellar systems. And these are some recent, uh, well, 2019, not so recent, but hydrodynamical simulation modeling the formation of the second generation stars inside the pre-existing first generation system, and the. The two generation, in this case, we are just talking about two generation of stars are very different in terms of structural properties, kinematical properties. And we are studying a lot of different questions here. How long does it take for the two generation to acquire the same spatial distribution? How long kinematical differences are preserved? And how long it takes for those uh, for uh, then internal dynamical processes to erase those differences and so on. So this figure here, for example, shows that this uh, simulation predicts that the second generation is initially more concentrated in the inner region and takes some time to finally acquire a spatial distribution similar to the first generation. And this is a case of a work in progress by Ethan White, another graduate student in my group, who is studying the long-term evolution of systems in which the first generation is more spherically distributed and the second generation is formed in a rotating disk in the inner regions and is gradually evolving to become more and more spherical and more similar to the first generation. So this is just a general overview of some of the the projects we are working on. And uh, before giving the uh, microphone to Vaslab, I'd like to thank all the research technology staff for the great support that we have here that allows us to uh, use these great supercomputers and to be able to do cutting edge research. That's so we are very grateful for that. And I will give the word to Vaslab who will finish the second part of the talk. Does anybody have any quick questions for Enrico while they are switching? Yeah, oh, in the back, sorry. Just a very quick question. Do I understand correctly that, that you solve the equations of motion of every object assuming that the stars are point sources or do you give the star some particular structure and that would introduce the additional shorter time scales? That, that's a very good question. There are several kinds of, oh, sorry. There are several kind of simulations. There are one where we are only worried about the dynamics. So we want to study the structure, but we are not focusing on the effects of dynamics on the stellar. So in that case, they are point masses. 
they just we care just about the dynamics the other simulation where the actual uh, structure of the star is taken into account in some simplified way of course now nothing comparable to this uh, evolution that you can do with a stellar evolution code but that's it depends on the kind of simulation some cases there are point masses in some cases there are recipes to consider the internal structure and the resulting uh, object that you get when two objects merge or so there are different level of simulation going from point masses to more complex simulation where you take into account the internal structure to some extent great thank you enrico Okay, perfect. Um, uh, my name is Václav Pavlík. I am. I arrived to Bloomington as a postdoc in 2020, and since August, I am now a lecturer at the physics department. Um, and my main collaborator at IU is um, Enrico, who gave you a really nice overview about all the projects that his group is doing at the Department of Astronomy. So I'm going just briefly recap, so we are on the same page. Uh, star clusters are self-gravitating systems composed of stars. This means that they, their evolution is mainly driven by their own gravity, the gravity that's um, uh, generated by the stars. And I'm going to use the label N for stars in, in this talk. So just keep in mind uh, what, what the big N uh, means. We have multiple um, different varieties of clusters. Um, some of them are really young and really small. They go from uh, 1,000 to 10,000 stars. Uh, some of them are big and don't have that much actually almost no gas between stars those are global clusters that Enrico was talking about and their uh, range of stars they contain goes from uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of stars so these um, objects because they are so big and so um, uh, massive their evolution takes millions to billions of years. And that's also the evolution of the stars they contain. So nuclear time scale is millions to billions of years and uh, similar for uh, the object itself. So it's um, almost impossible to observe um, any major evolution of these systems within thousands of human lifetimes. So we have to come up with different techniques to um, study the evolution, the global evolution of these systems. And we can um, use analytic estimates that's uh, developed some theory uh, that uh, we can then uh, compare with observations. We can use uh, Monte Carlo approaches, uh, which you which basically work for um, easier systems. Or if you want a system that is more complicated, more realistic, you have to use um, n-body approach. So you have to solve the n-body problem, which is what we do. What is the n-body problem? It actually follows the question that was raised uh, a minute ago if we use uh, any diameter of stars? Well, for the n-body problem, you don't need to. Uh, you treat all stars as point masses, and that works reasonably fine if you have large separation between bodies, uh, if you don't consider uh, collisions, direct collisions, or some uh, uh, close binary interactions. The second uh, ingredient in n-body problem is that you only use Newtonian force law. This is basic Newtonian dynamics that you know from uh, middle school, and it works reasonably well if you don't consider general relativity and um, all these um, post-Newtonian uh, effects on gravitational wave, et cetera. So you know um, probably this equation that's, that's describing the Newtonian force law. That's a general equation between, um, that describes the force between uh, two objects of uh, two masses, and it's inversely proportional to the distance between these objects square. And it works same for apples, it works same for the moon and the earth, and it works the same for all the stars in a globular cluster. The only difference is that for the moon, you can calculate it by hand. You can, you can send a spacecraft to the moon using human force, piece of paper, and, and a lot of, lot of pens, and you can calculate how the spacecraft is gonna arrive to the moon. You cannot do the same thing for a star cluster. And that is because this is a force between two bodies, but as we saw, you have millions of bodies, hundred thousands to millions of bodies in a star cluster. So this force law becomes increasingly more difficult because you now have to sum over all the ends, all the interaction between pairs of stars to actually determine how these stars interact with each other. 
and that is this actually contains three n equations because you need to solve it for three Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. Those are three n differential equations that you need to solve, second order differential equations. So impossible to do for thousands of bodies with just um, pen and paper. The force calculation is of the complexity of n squared because you have to do this uh, between each bodies. But the relaxation time, which is the time scale for global evolution of star clusters, as, Rico, as Enrico was talking about, that also grows with n. So this can be easy to do. I can do a simulation with 1,000 stars on my laptop with no problem. It's going to run a few days. But it becomes increasingly more difficult to do the same computation for a realistic size star cluster because equivalent simulations that will give you the same time evolution in millions of years in the real time, in a physical time, are a complexity of n cube. So you need computational power um, that is beyond what you have in hand. That also tells you why the evolution, why um, papers that studied star clusters evolution took so much time from 1960s to 2015 before they actually reached something reasonable size system, which was the million body problem by Long Wang at the top. We have not yet overcome million body problem since 2015, but you can see that the evolution sort of um, represents Moore's law. As your resources are evolving, you are able to attack, uh, tackle more complicated problems. So you need a combination of high-end hardware, which is, for instance, Big, uh, Big Red 200. You need optimized implementation and well-designed software. All these have to interplay, um, have to be um, in sync to answer your questions about star cluster dynamics. The software we are using um, you, um, follows direct summation and body integrations, the end money problem. It's called Enbody 6, has been developed for the last 45 years or so. And we use its parallel variations because we need to, we want to exploit all the power that um, multiple CPUs or multiple GPUs clusters can give us to reduce the computational time. So, just briefly, how um, a run uses CPUs and GPUs. There are two main um, force calculations that you need to consider, and that is built in and body six as one of the main simplification that you can do. Um, imagine that you have a family, you have neighbors, you probably interact with them on a daily basis. You only interact with your distant relatives once a year, twice a year. That's exactly what stars need to do um, in star clusters. You need to calculate the force between the immediate neighbors more frequently than the force between distant stars because they don't change much what is happening here if they are far away. So the regular, the reg time step, that's the force calculation between the distant stars. And irregularly, you are calculating all the force uh, that is happening in, in um, the immediate neighborhood of each star. And then you also need to treat binary stars, which are on shorter time scales. Those are the KS blocks there. So you are dividing the computation on GPUs between the many distant stars, CPUs for your immediate neighborhood, which is probably like 50, 50 stars out of the 100,000, and binary stars, which are double pairs or triples that um, interact with each other. So you do that on CPUs and GPUs, and you can do it on one node, you can do it on many nodes using all these um, OpenMP, CUDA, um, advanced vector extension, and um, MPI techniques to solve the equations more rapidly and uh, get your results um, quicker. So you don't have to wait several years to actually compute something. If you want to then, um, this was just for n body problem, but now imagine that you actually want to solve something that's gonna represent the real cluster. So first of all, you need large number of stars, then uh, you go to millions. You need stars of different masses because not every star has the same mass in the cluster. You need stellar evolution. You need multiple populations, as Enrico was saying. You need binary stars, even from the beginning of uh, the evolution of star clusters, because we know that probably like 50%, maybe even 100% of binaries uh, of stars are created in binary stars, then you need to consider that stars are not isotropically distributed. They don't have isotropic distribution of velocities. Uh, you need to calculate this for a long time because these systems are very old. 
And last but not least, you need to consider that they are not living isolated, but they are living in some galaxy. So you need to consider tidal fields, uh, stripping of stars, mass loss, and all these things to actually approach uh, realistic star clusters. And all these things will be um, more complicated for your calculations that will slow your calculation down because you need to consider what are the time scales of these things and how to effectively implement them in your codes and in, in your hardware. So just to conclude, um, parallelization is essential for big data astrophysics, not only for uh, observations, but also for simulations. And with the help of GPUs, we are now able to simulate realistic global clusters that have binary stars. Uh, we can simulate them for billions of years, and um, we can simulate them with stellar evolution to get realistic picture of what these systems look like. Thank you. Any questions? We have a couple, so a couple questions. Tight. Uh, thank you. So uh, my question is, does uh, the, the behavior of the cluster change uh, with N? So like from N to mi a million to a billion. So how different is uh, the behavior of the cluster? How different is the behavior? Well, there are several things if you have really small clusters few thousands they will more likely this dissolve than form a dense core if you have more stars they could they the cell gravitational potential uh goes to core collapse goes to the uh, need of binary stars uh, there is actually a paper that gives the limit on small n versus large n but you can sort of assess some of the characteristics with smaller n um like 16,000, 30,000 stars, what is gonna happen with millions of stars, but then you cannot scale everything because uh, if you have a realistic mass function that in a cluster that has only 10,000 stars, you would have so few high mass stars, but in a cluster that has millions of stars, you actually will create the realistic population of high mass stars. So some things are scalable, some things are not. Thanks. And also the initial condition, that that's a matter? That matters. Yes, that matters. That's that's actually everything that is in the um, realistic um, model. You need to consider there are so many initial conditions you can choose from. Um, the easiest one is so-called Plummer model, spherical symmetric um, that follows direct. That's a that's the easiest solution of Boltzmann equations. But you can also include truncation at some tidal radius, um, which is models that we do. Uh, it matters. It matters deeply what, what you do. And the evolution, especially with anisotropy in, in stellar velocities, will affect how the cluster evolves in, in long, uh, long term. Thanks. Um, hi. I, I was curious on how, um, and this was for both talks too, on how when you simulate the globular uh, clusters at different time scales, how I'm curious on how the different time scales, whether it's a day or a million or a billion years, how um, because obviously the initial conditions do matter, how each of those time scales contributes to the larger evolution of the cluster. I imagine that some dynamics that occur within maybe a year are not necessarily important at a time scale of a billion years. So I assume that there may be times where some dynamics at different time scales can be considered constant at larger time scales um, or is that not is that not the case i guess i will answer one part of the question and rico will handle the other one um so for instance if you have it's almost unimaginable that in a star cluster that has 100,000 stars um a single binary star would have an effect that single binary star that imagine earth around the sun orbits once a year. If you replace the Earth by another star, you have a binary system orbits around uh, each other on a time scale of a year. That little system of two stars actually can contain the same amount of binding energy that the whole system, the whole star cluster of 100,000 stars. So if you reach the, the evolutionary stage when the core becomes increasingly more dense, so-called core collapse, that binary star is inevitable to be formed and it can suck all the energy, all the binding energy that will make the cluster collapse further and be ejected by three body, four body interactions from the cluster away 
so the cluster can expand again. So this interaction, this evolution on the time scale of a year actually has deep um, effect on the evolution that's happening on the millions of years of um, evolution of the cluster. Enrico, if you want to add something. No, nothing to add. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. processes that have time scales so short as a few years are relevant as Vassilov said. Yeah. So that's part of the price that we have to pay for yes. to do this. You can, of course, if you simulate um, a cluster, you can remove the binary star, which is actually what's happening in um, this KS block. You actually remove this binary star because you can solve it um, if more efficiently outside of all these other stars. Uh, you remove it, you've calculated solution, treat it as a point, um, uh, as, a, as a center of mass when it interacts with the other stars and then put it back once your conditions for putting it back are satisfied. So you can do that for all binary stars until you need them actually to uh, revert the core collapse or something. And there are a few people on Zoom. If you are on Zoom and you have a question for the speaker, you're welcome to unmute and ask a question, but we have one in the room right now. Hi, that was a great talk. Um, it's interesting how, you know, we both gave simulation talks. We're dealing with like totally different, you know, spatial and time and time at scale or er, scales of space and time. Um, so my question was sort of about how you guys were utilizing GPUs. Um, I was a little surprised that you put the, that you had each individual local environment in its own CPU and you use the GPU to look at the long range interactions. Um, Cause I guess my intuition is sort of that the long range interactions aren't going to change that much. So you don't need to update them as frequently, but the short range ones would you would, would change a lot more. So I guess my question is, do you think you could talk a little bit more about the thought process behind using GPUs? Uh, for the large for uh, the large scale interactions, and you know, maybe is it necessary for the for is it necessary for the CPU groups to be closely spatially located? And if it is, how often do you update those groups? Oh man, this is a lot of questions. I did not develop the code. Okay, <laughs> um, I can talk briefly about that because the large long scale interact long long range interaction, the regular time step, you need to calculate the force for hundreds of thousands of stars. So you need to parallelize it as maximal as possible and do it in short amount of time. Because if you would do it on CPUs, and actually that's um, Long Wang who developed the code that we are using, um, calculated uh, the same system on 320 CPUs, just using CPU parallelization and 32 GPUs plus CPU. and it was about 400 to 2,000 times faster to just use the parallelization for the long range forces. But for the CPU, you, if you use multiple CPUs, you are only handling a couple of stars. And as I was saying, I can calculate 1,000 stars on my computer. That's not the bottleneck of, the, of this interaction. The bottleneck is determining what is a binary star, when is a binary star uh, supposed to be removed. Um, then if you have large N, how many, interactions you need to uh, consider. And that's where the parallelization of GPUs comes in handy because in your work as well, GPUs is designed to do small calculation, one easy task for thousands of things at the same time. So that's that's the main um, reason for probably using the long range distance on, on these. But if you want more details, I would give, uh, um, I can give you uh, Long Wang's email. He's happy to answer 24 seven. <laughs> thank you yeah another great presentation just things totally outside my like knowledge in this whole field um but one of the things you mentioned was we're stuck on a six i, I don't know how you worded it but basically a million star cluster because uh since like 2015 is that due to computational resources as in, if you could scale this to as many, one of the biggest computers there is, would we be able to break that? Or is it due to the, the physics of the nature of everything going on? I don't think it's due to the physics. There is actually an attempt to model 2 million stars right now, but sort of a factor of two doesn't really matter in astrophysics. So unless we can model 10 million stars, which would be a representation of 47 Tuck, which is one of the big global clusters, um, there is no point in doing that, I would say, unless you want to explore 
uh, anisotropy, like different initial conditions, just for the sake of increasing n, it doesn't make sense to, to waste computational time because it's costly. So if you want to um, improve your models, uh, you do more realistic initial conditions, try something else, um, but not just for the sake of doing more bodies. Thank you. Great. In the essence of time, oh, uh, one quick question. Okay. It's taking me longer to walk to the person than the question will be probably. Thanks for the talk. So um, I would like to ask uh, about the role of Big Red 200 in this project, especially in the uh, parallel architecture of uh, in-body uh, method. So I see, as I see, maybe I misunderstand, but as I see, there is a mix of CPU's node and GPU's node. Uh, so both of them uh, were implemented use in, in big red uh, platform or you just use the GPU nodes from big red and CPUs from another server or no I use maybe... um, regularly um, 16 CPUs and four GPUs mm -hmm. on a single node um, with multi-threading mm -hmm. and we use big red 200 because it's empty no one is there <laughs> we don't have to wait like in carbonate for two days to actually run something till the moment huh? till we the are moment. not doing large <laughs> parallelization over multiple nodes like okay. um, um our colleague is doing uh -huh. we are just using one one node but do uh -huh. the maximum we can do on that node and, and that, that, all that's the enough. calculations yes all calculations are yes. handled there. yes okay interesting thank you i'll be editing the video <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's really great information. That's really great information for our staff to have. So I appreciate that. Any other, uh, I think in the essence of time. So if you go to the agenda, I sent everybody the workshop materials today and I sent you the agenda uh, Friday. So you can contact our speakers by going to people.iu.edu to look up their contact information that they make available if it is there. So uh, uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Yes, let's thank all of our speakers today.